Um, so if you missed any of the others, I'd encourage you to go online and um, hear about, uh, or rather hear on, on the unpacking of the pattern of prayer that the Lord Jesus Christ gave us while he walked on the earth. So today I'll carry on in our teaching on the Lord's Prayer. And even as we look at it, uh, I'll just like to remind everyone here that our Father isn't the Lord's Prayer. Our Father isn't a prayer that we recite, but it is a pattern for prayer that Christ gave to us. Because in it is, I believe, eternal wisdom on the pattern that God would intend to see the most fruit come from our prayer lives and to see the most fruit come from our Christian walk. And ultimately, we cannot build things of eternal value without prayer. It's impossible to grow spiritually without prayer. It's impossible for us to know God if we are not prayerful. These things do not just happen, but God intended for us to pray always. And when Christ walked the earth, he set an example by praying always. Oftentimes in the, in the Gospels, we'll see Christ go away by himself a long time before sunrise and pray for hours at a time. If our Lord himself prayed like that, then prayer indeed is a necessity for every believer. So today, even as we, even as we further unpack the prayer, I'd like to spend a bit of time looking at the Lord's Prayer overall as we wrap up. Because I feel it's important to highlight one key feature about the Lord's Prayer. And the point that I want to make is that love is the motivation for prayer. In Matthew 22, in Matthew 22, if you ever read that chapter, Christ is being cross-examined by different teachers and different experts in the law. And we have the Pharisees, Sadducees, and lawyers ask Christ question after question to see how best they can either debate with him and trip him up. Towards the end of this argument, they ask him a question, and this is from the lawyers or the law experts, the ones who are experts in the Torah, which are the first five books of the Bible. And they ask Christ, which is the great, which is the great commandment in the law? And essentially what they were asking Christ is, which is the greatest of the commands that were given? And the reason why they would ask this question is because as experts of the law, there were people who held different schools of thought. And them being experts, they would have known the pros and cons of every argument. And they were getting ready to get into a debate with Jesus. Because different people had opposing views to what the greatest command was. But unfortunately for them, they didn't know that they were speaking to the lawgiver, the one who founded all, all scripture, the one who founded the culture of the, Jew, the Hebrews at the time. The Torah came from Christ, who is the word of God. And when he responded, he responded giving them the framework or rather the foundations of what the law is. He gave them the, he gave them the back end of what was happening when the law was given to Moses and to the subsequent leaders in Israel. And in Matthew twenty-two thirty-seven to 40, he says, And he said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. Love God and love others are the two pillars that are foundational to all truth. Because at the time, the law and the prophets was actually the Bible that they had. It was the law, the Psalms, and the prophets. And the two pillars that stand is love for God and love for your neighbor. They asked him for one, and he gave them two. But in verse 39, he says, the second one is like the first. Because the two go together, and the two are inseparable. They were asking for him to rank the first one, and maybe they would have a debate on what was the second. But what Christ was saying is that the first and the second are like each other. They're two sides of the same coin. 
if it were a, a race, it would not be a marathon where people um, finish first and then uh, after a couple of minutes you have someone come second. If it were a race, it would be a 100 meter sprint at the Olympics where what separates the first and the second is just a point of a second. And what Christ was saying is that the first is love for God, but the second, which is similar to it, is love for others. So let us not separate them ourselves, because we, we have people who say that I love God, but it's people that are the problem. And truly, yes, people can be a problem and difficult to love. However, when Christ told us what the greatest commandments were, he paired these two together. Now I'd like for us to look at our Father, and you can see it on the screen. Because I believe that the undercurrent of the Lord's Prayer is love for God and love for others. What underpins the prayer that we've been going through these past couple of months is a love for God and how best we can develop and grow in that and a love for others. Because our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, we discussed is how we enter the how we enter the place of prayer, worshiping God for who he is. Your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven shows our love for God because Christ himself said, if you love me, you'll obey my commands. And when we seek out his will and when we seek out the establishment of his kingdom, we are actually growing in our love for God. Give us this day our daily bread we discussed last time is how we go to God and ask for what we need, but it's also how we spend time with God daily. It's where we build intimacy with Christ. It is where he takes from what it is. He takes of himself and he gives it to us. And it is also a place where we grow in our love for God if we do it consistently. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors is predominantly loving other people. Because in this part of the prayer, we're saying, Lord, forgive me when I have sinned and hurt others. And also, I will do the same to those who sin and hurt me. It goes from being Godward now to the people that are related, or, I mean, the people that are around you. And Tony spoke of this a couple of weeks um, on forgiveness, and that the reason why we forgive is because we are forgiven. And it's a heart that recognizes what Christ has done that is inflamed with the love of God that is then able to love others. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one is also love for others. Because what we are saying is, Lord, help me not to keep sinning. Because all that is fallen in this world, all the pain and all the suffering is a result of sin. We cannot love our neighbor effectively if we are sinful people. Sin is what hurts. Sin obviously offends God, but sin is also what hurts our fellow man. It's hard to sin without crossing, or rather crossing the boundary of loving your neighbor. And so, even in the prayer of, our, of the Lord's Prayer, or rather in the framework that Christ gave in the Lord's Prayer, we see the two pillars upon which all the laws and the prophets are founded. We see a love for God and a love for others being the foundation of the prayer pattern that Christ laid out. Because Christ in his wisdom teaches us that the pattern for prayer is an exercise in love. That this pattern in the Lord's prayer which he gave us is an exercise in love. Because if you faithfully pray according to this pattern, you'll be fulfilling the greatest command. Because in prayer, we'll be actively seeking to love God better, and in prayer, we'll be actively seeking to love our fellow man better. Amen? And so as we come to a close of our study in this, in this uh, prayer, I want to remind us all that it's possible to have prayer founded on things other than love. It's possible to have prayer founded on self-ambition which is predominantly, what can I get? And God, what can you give me? It's possible to have your motive for prayer being self. It's possible for you to be seeking God for lavish living and seeking God for 
seeking God with a heart that is rooted in the pride of life. It's possible for you to go into the prayer and to begin to pray for your enemies to suffer when God has actually called us to love our fellow man. So prayer, so prayer as Christ has highlighted is prayer, or rather prayer as Christ has laid it out, is should be rooted in love. It should be rooted on the two greatest commands that Christ himself gave. And the, po- the point I want to make, and the one point I want to leave here, is that when it comes to prayer, our heart position is more important than the words we say. Because in Matthew 6 verse 8, just before he goes into the Lord's Prayer, Christ says, the Father knows what you need before you even ask him. Before you even open your mouth to communicate, the Lord already knows what is in your heart. Christ says that your Father knows what you need before you ask him because when you approach him in the place of prayer, what he looks at first is what is in your heart. What is your heart position? Matthew 15, 8 gives an example of this where it says, These people draw near to me with their mouth and they honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. It is possible for you to say all the right things in the place of prayer, but your heart be in a different location altogether. And when Christ laid out the framework for prayer, I think it's important for us to know that the Lord's Prayer is actually an exercise in a love for God and a love for others. And may the Lord help us cultivate that kind of heart when we go to God in the place of prayer. Because Christ's framework in the Lord's Prayer teaches us that love is the motive for why we pray. Prayer in this way and according to this pattern fulfills the law and is pleasing to our Lord. Prayer is not what can I get from God, but how can I love God, and how can I love others more? And if you struggle with this, my encouragement to you will be to remain rooted in Scripture, because it is Scripture itself which transforms the way that we think. It is Scripture itself which molds our hearts such that when we pray, we, be, we progressively beca- begin to fashion, or rather, we progressively begin to present a heart that is pleasing to God, a heart that approaches God motivated by love and not motivated by self or anything in between. Amen. I like what Tony usually says when he stands here. He's like, I like to hear feedback from you guys. So, amen. 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 Thank you. I'm going to keep using that line. So now we're going to look at and spend some time looking at the final line in the Lord's Prayer. I will not touch on forgive us of our trespasses because Tony covered that, in, uh, ex- he covered that extensively over a couple of weeks. But we're going to look at Matthew 6.13 and do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. And the first point I want to make is that prayer takes sin seriously and recognizes spiritual opposition. Prayer takes sin seriously and recognizes spiritual opposition. Temptation isn't sin. And last week, or this week rather, on Tuesday, we had men's discipleship, and one of the key things we were discussing, uh, we were going over a chapter in moral purity. And one of the key things in that chapter is the fact that temptation isn't sin. So some of the questions that were asked during our discussion is, okay, then where is the line between temptation and sin, particularly sin of the heart and sin of the mind? And we came to a conclusion that temptation isn't sin, however, it can lead to sin. And when we begin to cultivate temptation, make a room for it, begin to water it and give it oxygen, then it can evolve into sin. However, temptation on its own is not sin. And Hebrews 4.15 says, For we, do, speaking about Christ, we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. We will all be tempted if we walk this life. And if you attempt to live a Christian life, If you attempt to live as a Christian 
you'll be tempted all the more. However, temptation can lead to sin, and that's why it should be taken seriously. We acknowledge temptation in the place of prayer. Christ calls us to acknowledge temptation in the place of prayer. And we ask and we seek for help from him. James 1 verse 13 to 15 in the Amplified says the following. Let no one say when he's tempted, I am being tempted by God. For temptation does not originate from God, but from our own flaws. For God cannot be tempted by what is evil, and he himself tempts no one. But each one is tempted when he is dragged away, enticed, and baited to commit sin by his own worldly desire. Then, when the illicit desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and when sin has run its course, it gives birth to death. The progression is clear. And when the Lord says we should pray, do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one, sometimes we can have a wrong picture of what that is actually saying. Because I don't know about you, but whenever I used to go over that prayer and reach that part, to me it sounds like we need to remind God not to lead us into temptation. Almost like this is something that God tends to do. He tends to lead people into temptation, and we need to remind him not to do it. Like, God, don't do it. Don't lead me into temptation. I do not need that extra stress in my life. However, that's not what it's saying. Because first and foremost, we are not the subject. We are not the focus of this line. We are not the center or the focus of what Christ is saying. It's not about us. It's actually about God. Even grammatically, Christ is the subject, or rather God is the subject of that sentence and not us. It's not about me, and it is God who is being spoken about in that sentence. It's an appeal made to God, because it is God who leads us. It is God who delivers us, and what he delivers us from is the clutches of the evil one. It is about what Christ is doing. It is about what God can do for us. It is about how he can save us and how he can help us in the time when we are te most tempted. And the reason why it is important and why Christ highlights the fact that we should put it in the place of prayer is because he's not saving us from men. He's saving us from the evil forces that rule this world. He's saving us from spiritual powers that are ancient from spiritual intelligence that spans millennia, from angels that are older than time who are plotting for all of our downfall. If the enemy had his way, each and every one of us here would be in a grave. And when we say, do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one, we are appealing to the only one who can deliver us from evil. It is an appeal to the Lord to, because of our it is an appeal to the Lord because of what he can do for us and how he can save us. The evil one is always ready to lead us through the doorway of temptation and to walk us through the progression that we saw in James 1.13. For temptation to lead to lust and desire, for that desire to lead to sin, and for that sin ultimately to lead to death. That is why he's here and that's his ultimate goal and his ultimate goal is to drag us down into the pit with him. We need a sober understanding of just exactly what it is we're up against. Because if we treat it lightly, we have already fallen for the trap of the enemy. If we treat it lightly, we will not cry out and plead to God how Christ is calling us to plead to him in the place of prayer. We take temptation seriously because we are not coming up against the things of man, but every temptation, no matter how benign it may seem, is rooted in evil that is far stronger than our frame can handle. It is rooted in an evil that we ourselves do not have the native capability to overcome. So when it is Christ puts it as a pattern for prayer, he's saying, pray this way as often as you pray. Cry out to God for help in the time of temptation 
to, in the help, not just in the time of temptation, but to always cry out for him, to him, to, for him to deliver us from evil. We cry out to help because without our Lord, we stand no chance to ever effectively follow Christ. I put up a quote from C.H. Spurgeon that says the following. The first lesson from prayer lead us into temptation is this. Never toast to your own strength. Never say, oh, I shall never fall into such follies and sins. They may try me, but they will find more than a match in me. Let not him that puts on his honors boast as though he were putting it off. Never indulge one thought of congratulation as to self-strength. You have no power of your own. You are as weak as water. The devil has only to touch you in the right place, and you will run according to his will. And here in the Lord's Prayer is a divine balance. Because in lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one, there is a sober recognition of spiritual opposition and a desperate appeal to the one who is greater than all and who is actually able to deliver us from sin. There is no sin that you cannot commit, and to think so is to be ignorant of the potency of sin's enterprise. There is no sin that we cannot commit. And for us to think we are above any sort of sin is for us to fail to understand the potency of what it is we are up against. But praise be to God for he keeps us. Praise be to God for he leads us. And praise be to God for he delivers us from the evil one. And Christ teaches us to cry out to him as often as we pray. 1 Corinthians 10.13 says the following in the Amplified, No temptation, regardless of its source, has overtaken or enticed you that is not common to human experience. Nor is any temptation unusual or beyond human resistance. But God is faithful to his word and he is compassionate and trustworthy. And he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability to resist but along with the temptation he has in the past and now and will always provide the way out as well so that you will be able to endure it without yielding and you will overcome temptation with joy. Our Lord does not lead us to temptation. God does not lead us into temptation, but he regulates it. And he provides a way out at every single point. If he did not regulate it, the enemy would have his way and we would not be here today. However, the Lord is gracious and our cry, is, our cry to him in prayer is an acknowledgement that he is the one who is able to save. He is the one who is able to deliver. And even as believers, he is the one who is able to help us overcome the sins that so easily beset us. It is the Lord himself who delivers, and it is the Lord who we cry out to for help. Because prayer does not ignore the presence of the evil one, or make light of every enticement that will ins can potentially enslave our souls. However, instead, Christ teaches us that we should cry out to the only one who can save us from death, and to do so as often as we pray, but we must pray. We cannot take sin lightly. We cannot sit in it comfortably and assuming that at some point I'm going to mature as a Christian. At every single point of maturity, we will need Christ's participation. And he does more than we'll ever know, but we should actively cry out to him. In Hebrews 5, 7, we see an example of Christ's prayer life. We don't have many examples in the New Testament or rather in the Gospels of what was the content of Jesus' prayer. When he went out by himself, we don't get much insight into what he was saying. But in Hebrews 5, 7, it says something interesting. It says, while Jesus was here on earth, he offered prayers and pleadings with a loud cry and tears to the one who could rescue him from death. 
and God heard his prayers because of his deep reverence for God. Christ prayed the way that he taught. He cried out to God constantly over his time here on earth. It says with loud cries and tears. Loud cries and tears is not a place you get to without actually being earnest and emo emotionally um, involved in that prayer. Christ, time and time again, motivated by his purpose here on earth, cried out to the Lord who was able to save him from death, and he teaches us to do the same in the Lord's Prayer. When we say, Lord, deliver us from the evil one, we are crying out to the only one who can save us from death. All sin, whether you perceive it to be small, or whether it's obvious that it is destroying your life, Wherever your sin may sit on your own rating and in on your own spectrum, all sin has the potential to bring you down into the pit. And this will, re this will lead us to treat sin and to treat temptations and to treat the very thing that trip us, trip us up with solemn attention. Because all sin has the capability to take us to the very place none of us want to go however benign or however little the sins may seem. Because if you understand the nature of the battle, you will know that all sin, as Christ highlighted, all sin, all sin is what can take someone to the grave. And even as we look at the example of Christ, we know that he, he taught us to pray, but he also earnestly prayed on the same. And even as believers, we know that we are saved from, we're saved from hell. Sure. But we need to understand the graveness or rather the seriousness of sin. Because sin has the capability to destroy or rather to kill your devotion to Christ. If we accommodate sin, willfully accommodate sin, we indeed expose ourselves to the very things that can destroy our walk with God and suck the very life out of our soul. And the enemy would be glad to continue to usher you because the progression is temptation, desire, sin, and death. A couple of years ago, I used to listen to a particular podcast, and that podcast is called Hardcore History. Um, it's, I was quite fascinated by it because I'm not a fan of history, but this particular podcast is done by a narrator who knows how to narrate historic events very well. Um, and if ever you get a chance to li listen to it, I'd encourage you to do so, but just know that every episode is five hours, so it is long. <laughs> um, and what he does is he speaks over different historic events, like World War II, or um, the Cuban Missile Crisis, or particular historic events that happened. But he goes into as much detail as you can fit in five hours, and he narrates the details of every single historic event as he does so in a dramatized way. And uh, on one of these episodes, it's a three-part series on World War I. And one of the things that really stood out for me, and I remember it till today, is that he highlighted how in World War I there were a shortage of soldiers because the fighting was carrying on for a long period of time and casualties were on the rise. They were in a rush to recruit soldiers to go out into war. And so what they'll do is that they'll have marketing campaigns and propaganda, quote unquote, to get enough young people, young men particularly, to sign up and go into the military. And because there was such a need for, for, for soldiers on the ground, training that will usually take two years perhaps would take maybe a three month period. So they were not extensively trained like the proper soldiers were, but they needed as much men to go and fight the war. So they rec recruited people and many people went to fight the war. So much so, that it became a cool thing amongst young people 
to gather as friends and say, hey, you know what, let's go enlist in the army and go to war and fight the war. Let us go and fight for country. And what happened, unfortunately, is that because many of these soldiers were not trained, and because it was such a big trend, whole communities lost all of their young men at a go. Because friends got together, perhaps here at church, uh, during men's discipleship, we say, hey guys, let's go and join the war. Because that's what we, that's the, that's, again, that's what we need, we should be doing. And unfortunately, it's only at the end of it, at a post-mortem where many soldiers, particularly those that were well-trained, said that the nation did a large disservice to all of those young men. Because the nation sent them out when they were not well-trained. And when they got on ground, they were not fully equipped to fight a war and a war of that magnitude. And thousands and hundreds of thousands of communities were impacted because all of their young men were wiped out. Because all of the young men were put on an expressway and they were hyped up but not well trained to go and fight a war that they knew nothing about. They signed up because it was trendy and it was the trendy thing to do amongst young people at the time. And because that is what they saw on all adverts, go and fight for your country, unfortunately, they were not well trained when they went. However, a well-trained soldier who enlisted at the time understood that they may die on the field. They were not moved by any trend, but they understood what war entailed. They went through rigorous training which put them in situations where they saw death and understood exactly what they were signing up for. Yet many got sent out and unfortunately, they, many of them well, there were many casualties and many communities were impacted as a result because when they reached the battlefield, they were the first to receive a bullet to the head. Because they were not well trained to know that you should wear your helmet at all times. Whether you are asleep or whether you're going to the bathroom or whether you're going to the toilet to always have your helmet on. Many of them died from cholera and dysentery because no one taught them, or rather no one trained them to know that on the battlefield, even water can kill you. And so many of them made mistakes on the field and there was no one there to be able to help them because they were in the middle of the battle. And many of them died near these deaths because they were sent, but they were not well trained when they were sent. How often do we do that in the church? We hype people up to join the Jesus crew with attractions and promises of gain. When the Bible says count the cost and make the decision soberly, we instead say come and have a party. When the Bible calls us to sit down and actually know what taking up your cross is, we unfortunately market Christianity as something that can be a fashionable item that you can add to your life. And unfortunately, they go into the battlefield hyped up, but not discipled. They go into the battlefield, and on the field awaits ancient evil. Ancient evil that is ready and ever ready to take their heads. And the reason I'm using graphic language is because that is exactly the, the gravity of the situation. I like how Tumayini spoke about evangelism and that yes, you can evangelize someone and they can come to the point of Christ in 15 seconds. But I like what she said immediately after that. Because what she said immediately after that is that we walk a journey with them. We disciple them. We don't leave them to go out into the field and to have the enemy have his way with them. When we say that one of our goals or other missions is to make disciples, it's so that we do not have untrained people on the battlefield. We do not have people on the battlefield who think that sin is fine, who are comfortable living in sin when they do not know that it's the very thing that will kill them, where they do not know that even on the battlefield, the water can kill you. And that's the, the small sins, the things that you think are so benign. I have a little anger, I, I mean, I have a little anger here and a little bitterness there. I am a little impatient here, I get a little angry there. 
those are the very things that the enemy can use to steal life from your soul and to kill your devotion to Christ. There is need for a sober reflection or other sober understanding of what sin is. And I'm not glorifying evil as I say this, but I'm trying to make you understand why Christ put this in the Lord's Prayer. Why he made the statement, lead me not into temptation, but deliver me from evil. He put it there because it is a mainstay in the Christian walk for us to realize that we are in a battle and to cry out to the one who can deliver us, to cry out to the only one who can deliver us. And when Christ also prayed himself, we saw in Hebrews 5, 7, he made the same cries and the same petitions to our Lord. So even in this part of the Lord's prayer, we pray and we cry out earnestly to the Lord who is able to save and deliver and to deliver us up to Christian, I mean, deliver us into Christ-like maturity. We do not enter the door through hype. We enter the door soberly knowing what it will cost and we walk aside one another and we disciple those who are less mature than us up until we all reach a stature where we can, comf we can confidently walk onto the battlefield and not fall for the tricks of the enemy. Another thing that one of the, the narrators said in this podcast was that in World War I, every day a soldier survived was a day that they earnestly prayed to survive another day. The number of casualties and the number of deaths was very high. And they cried out to God to help them survive another day because that's how bad it was. At the advanced conference that we went to a couple of weeks ago, during one of the speakings, uh, they highlighted how during COVID, after COVID, a large percentage of the church stopped attending service. I think it's like maybe 20 or 30 percent. 20 or 30 percent of people in the church in America were wiped out from the church over a two-year period. That should communicate that something is amiss in how we are cultivating disciples. That should communicate that perhaps maybe we're not highlighting the seriousness of sin. Perhaps maybe we're allowing people to live in willful sin and they think that everything is fine and when a crisis comes, they turn their back on Jesus altogether and the enemy has taken another one down. If over a short period of time, 30% can be wiped out of the church, it may, it may mean that we are not praying this prayer enough because we do not understand the gravity of the situation. When Christ calls us to make cries out to our Lord, he's calling us to call out to God who is able to save and sanctify. I love how we were singing earlier on today about the good work that Christ did and, he, and the good work that he continues to do because it is rooted in love. And that is why we are all here today. If you are a believer, it is Christ's love that brought you into the door. But I would not be doing you a disservice, and this church will not be doing you a, would not be doing you a service if we are telling you that come and everything will be okay. I would much rather come, tell you, come, you're going into a battle, and you're going to see your flesh die while you are alive. Because at least there, if that is not your cup of tea, you walk out the door, and your blood will not be on our hands. But if that is indeed what you believe and what, you, what we understand as a church, then we will keep saying that sin is serious. And if you're nursing sin in your life, life is slowly being sapped out of your soul and you don't even know it. You have no idea that the enemy wants your head. And Christ himself knows this. Which is why, before he left, he prayed the following. In John 17, verse 15. This is Christ before he goes to the cross. And this is Christ praying not just for his disciples, 
but for everyone that will come to believe in him. And he says the following, I do not pray that you will take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. Christ himself knows what it is we are up against. And he prays for us, and he, will, and he enlists us to cry out to him for help. Because the enemy that we are up against is an enemy that we have no chance against unless the Lord empower us. Unless he endow us with his spirit from on high. And unless we ourselves look at the sin in our lives and say, enough, Lord, help me with this thing. I'm not going to comfortably live in this very thing that wants to take me out. To reach out and to say, I need help. We have a community here, yes, but find someone who you're comfortable with if you are struggling with a particular sin, to say, I need someone to walk alongside me in this help, I mean, in this walk. And I'm sure that there'll be people willing to help you and to walk with you through this journey. Christ is praying for us. And I want us to know that he is involved or rather personally invested in seeing us all come to Christ-like maturity. Romans 8 verse 33 to 39 says that Christ intercedes for us. And the one who is interceding for us in his framework for prayer says that we should pray for deliverance and never leave that posture. As often as we pray, we say, Lord, I do not know what lays ahead. I do not know what is around the corner. I do not know what trap the enemy has laid for me. So deliver me from evil. Deliver me from evil, the evil that I do not even know about. Help me, Lord. And for the things that my, the temptations and my desires that so easily ensnare me, help me with that as well. And to cultivate a deep rootedness in truth and in the truth of scripture. We participate in our sanctification by crying out to him in the place of prayer. It is not optional and it should be embedded in how we pray. It should be embedded in the culture that we have when we pray. We participate in our sanctification also by having a faithful life or other faithful Bible study. We need to be rooted in scripture and we need to be prayerful if we are to walk this Christian walk. I spoke a bit earlier on about accountability. And sometimes how accountability relationships work in the church is that you go to someone and they ask you, did you sin this week? Did you, did you fall? Did you struggle? And those are valid questions indeed. But I believe the key questions that we should be asking is how is your prayer life and how consistent is it? And how much time have you spent in the word this week? Because if those two things are not in place, then temptations will ravage your soul and your desires will lead you to sin time and time and time again. Accountability should be how consistently are you crying out to God in the place of prayer? How consistently are you in the place of prayer reaching out to God and saying, Lord, help me in these areas? Because the more we rooted in Scripture, the more we study, I mean, the, more we study the Bible, the more we are in community, and the more we pray the better our odds are of achieving Christ-like maturity at, a, at, at, at God's intended pace. But while we do all this, I want to assure us all that our Lord continues to intercede even today on our behalf. Because if you're a follower of Jesus, he is interceding for you right now. And his intercession can save us to the utmost. As it says in Hebrews 7.25, Therefore, he is able to save forever those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. Right now in the throne room before God, Christ is making intercession for us as his children or us as his followers. For us as believers, he is making intercession for us right now. However, we partner with him in prayer. We don't say, Christ, yeah, you, you take the wheel. Because our battle is fought here on earth. 
and there's real wickedness and real evil that is after us. There's real wickedness and evil in the systems that rule this world. God didn't, Christ didn't pray that we get taken out, but that we get delivered time and time again from the evil one. So we pray as he prays. As he intercedes, we also pray on our side. We pray for ourselves and we intercede for our brothers and sisters. We pray and we don't stop praying because that's what Christ did when he was here. That's the pattern and the, that's the, pattern and the framework that he laid out for us. I have a quote before I close. Let this doctrine, and it's a quote by John Bunyan. It's a bit of old English, but bear with me. Let this doctrine give thee boldness to come to God. Shall Jesus Christ be interceding in heaven? O oh, then, be thou a praying man on earth. Yea, take courage to pray. Think thus of thyself. I go to God, to God, before whose throne the Lord Jesus is ready to hand my petitions to him. He ever lives to make intercession for me. This is a great encouragement to come to God by prayers and supplications for ourselves and by intercessions for our families, our neighbors, and enemies. Amen. So in closing, I would just like to encourage you that perhaps the one when you came to Christ, you perhaps had a different picture of what following Christ looked like. Perhaps you came in by way of hype and you are not properly discipled and have not yet learnt the lethal potency of willful sin. I would encourage you in your life to root yourself in the ancient truth of Scripture because it's the ancient truths that are able to transform us into the people that can overcome sin. This will make you battle ready. And I, pray, I implore you to desperately pray to the one who can keep you faithful to the very end. To pray that the mind of Christ may be formed in you so that you have an accurate view of sin in your life. And my prayer is also that you can get into relationship with someone who's a bit more mature than you in, Christian, in, in their Christian walk. Who can help disciple you so that you're battle ready. So that when you go into the field of life and the enemy tries to steal you away from the church and to get you to turn your back on Christ, that still you'll be able to fight, stand, and overcome sin. Because you're battle ready and because you pray to the one who is able to deliver you. May it never be said in our nation that we have households and neighborhoods that are empty of the Christian witness because Christ was marketed as a fashionable item or a fashionable trend and people served him conveniently and eventually turned their back on him. May that never be said of our communities in our nation and may we pray for our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. And if you're here and you do not know Christ at all, I hope that this message painted a clear picture of what it is you are up against. Because the enemy is taking down everyone with him. His goal is not those who follow Christ or don't follow Christ. He wants all humanity to go down with him. And if you do not know Christ, I assure you that the plans have already been set in place for you to go down to the pit. But even as we sung earlier, there is one who loves. Because not only did he teach us to pray, not only did he teach us to love, he himself gave himself on the cross. Because the seriousness of sin required blood to be shed. And he voted, or rather willingly laid down his life and shed his blood for us to have eternal life. My encouragement to you, or rather my message to you today, is that Christ died for you as well. He died so that you can be liberated, so that you can call to the one who can deliver and completely save, and to call on him, on him who can deliver you from the evil one. May we stand and pray. As I mentioned, if you are struggling in any way, 
the best remedy is a prayer life and a faithful and consistent study of your Bible, but also community and accountability. These are all words that we know, these are all words that we hear, but these are the very things that will keep us from the enemy taking us out on the battlefield. So these are things that we take with solemn attention and these are things that we take to heart. And I want to remind you all that may our prayers be rooted in love the same way Christ intercedes on our behalf today, motivated by his love for us. May we, in the place of prayer, continue to love those, or rather continue to love God and continue to love others. Let us pray. Father God, I thank you for your word. I thank you for your love. I thank you that by your son we have life. We have life abundant as a result of what it is you did on the cross. I thank you that you saw the seriousness of sin and instead decided to lay your life down on our behalf so that we may never experience death and separation from God. I pray here as we stand, may you move in our hearts and minister to us in the areas, Lord, where even though we've come to a point of salvation, we are untrained and we live comfortably in willful sin. I pray, Father, that the cry of the Lord's prayer may be the cry of our hearts, that, Lord, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. I pray, Father, that you may, in your own way, connect people and connect people, Lord Jesus, to people who may disciple and move in the hearts of people to disciple others, Lord, so that we are all battle-ready and well-trained. May we never go out into battle untrained. And I pray, Father God, for those who do not know you, and those who aren't believers. I pray that they may come to a knowledge of your salvation, that you grant them the grace that brings salvation, and you bring them into the camp. And I pray that you empower them by your spirit to be a disciple and a faithful follower of Christ. Father God, we thank you for your word. We thank you that you intercede even for us now. I thank you in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. I really felt as Arthur was preaching that God wants us to respond right now as a church. I'm going to read um, from the book of James, chapter 5. It says, is anyone among you in trouble? Let them pray. Is anyone happy? Let them sing songs of praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let them call the elders of the church to pray over them. And I anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise them up. If they have sinned, they will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. And as each, each one of us were listening to Arthur, we know that the Holy Spirit is at work. He's not speaking, just like making noise. It's not possible that he was speaking to nobody. So I really felt the Lord say that let's turn into groups of three and pray for one another. So you know in your own heart what you're going to ask your friend, your neighbor, to pray for you. As I've read the scripture, as Arthur has preached, if you don't know Jesus, the gospel has been shared very clearly. This is your opportunity to respond to the gospel. But you may be sick, maybe you are heart sick, maybe your mind, maybe your emotions, maybe you're struggling with sin, maybe you're struggling with believing God, who he is. It could be anything. And maybe you're rejoicing because you're in a good place. But let's respond to this preach today by just turning into small groups and pray for one another. Please don't also look for your friend. You know, it's not about looking for your friend. Just turn to the person next to you, introduce yourself, and share as the Holy Spirit leads you. Just share and start to pray. And then in a few minutes, Arthur, um, Alice will come and close for us. Amen.